you get to see it too? Or? Hi, my name is Katie Yates, and I'm from the SETI Institute. I'm very happy to handle a lot of the media issues. And I'm so happy today to be here with Jason Rowe. Uh, Jason, do you want to say hi? Hi, everybody. How's it going? <laughs> hello, hello. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, so I'll give you a little background on Jason. Jason received his PhD at the University of British Columbia for work on measuring the reflectivity of extrasolar planets using photometric measurements from the Canadian MOST satellite. After his PhD, Jason joined the Kepler team uh, as a NASA postdoctoral fellow contributing towards the first Kepler discoveries. Jason is currently a research scientist at the SETI Institute and a member of the Kepler Science Office. His interests include exoplanet and stellar characterization to help with the nature of distant worlds. And Jason celebrated some pretty big news coming out on press releases last week, so that is what we're here to talk about today. So Everybody wants to know about 715, so. <laughs> we want to know about 717, or 15. So our title here was that we're presenting Jason Rowe and the Planet Bonanza, which I have not gotten tired of saying, um, and I hope that you haven't gotten tired of hearing. So. <laughs> So Jason, I would love for you to tell us a little bit about your um, background and how you got started with the Kepler team. Sure. Um, so my background is, uh, I, as you mentioned earlier, I did my PhD up in Vancouver, up in Canada at the University of British Columbia. Uh, and my passion for astronomy has been going on for since I was itty bitty, just tiny. <laughs> um, I think my first, I, I've been I've been asked this question before, and I've thought more about it, of like really what got me going in astronomy. And earliest I can remember is, I think it was show and tell for kindergarten, where in the newspaper I saw this picture of the first free-floating astronaut. Oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah, if you remember the movie, I don't know if you've ever seen Gravity, but you have George Clooney sort of floating around in his <laughs> suit. And this was back in the 80s when they first released the tether from the first astronaut. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever. And then ever since then, I've been paying attention to anything that's been associated with space and have worked as hard as I could to be able to contribute to the results that we'll talk about today. Very, very cool. So um, we a lot of times with these calls, we have a younger audience, people who kids who are looking at maybe following in your footsteps. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And, what steps they can do in terms of study. But how did you go from your initial work to getting connected with the Kepler team? Sure. So my direct connection for at least getting involved with the Kepler team started with working on what, what the, the MOST satellite. So the MOST satellite is, uh, is a Canadian space telescope um, that is literally about that big. It weighs around 80 kilograms, uh, and it houses a 15-centimeter telescope. And this telescope was launched into space um, back in 2000 and, uh, 2003, I believe it was, a while ago. And its mission was to study both stars and planets. So I used it to, to look for reflectivity from the first planets that were discovered. Um, and then as I finished my PhD, I started looking for a job. And there was a job advertised for Kepler that basically wanted someone who knew how to use space telescopes. So I applied and said, yeah, I've worked on other space telescopes. <laughs> And they hired me, and it's been a blast since. I've been with Kepler since 2007, and I'm going to stay as long as I possibly can. That's incredible. Okay, so now we're to the point of the show. Can you summarize for us what your team recently found? Sure. So last Wednesday, we announced the, the verification of 715 new planets. Uh, this is a big announcement because previous to that announcement there were roughly only a thousand planets known uh, since about 1980. So it took about 20 years to get about a thousand planets and then through the work of Kepler we were able to do this bonanza as it was announced. <laughs> 15 new planets, so almost doubling the number of known planets overnight. That is very cool, very cool. Okay, so um, can you can you kind of summarize what about this dis what about this project has been most exciting for you? Sure. So the easily the most exciting about this, and maybe I'll start by describing what the planetary systems are like. I think that segues into why I find them exciting. For sure. The planets that we found are not your large Jupiter-sized planets. They are predominantly small. 
more than 90%, but 95% of them are smaller than Neptune, with a large fraction of them about Earth-sized. So we're, of the planets that we're finding, they're mostly small. We were also able to characterize the orbits, so how they, sur how they orbit around their host star. And we found that the orbits are circular, and on top of that, the orbital planes are aligned. So that means that the planetary systems look more like a pancake, as opposed to your classical view of an atom, where you see things at all different angles shooting around. So if I tell you that planets are small, and they're in circular orbits, and their orbital planes are aligned, it immediately reminds us of our inner solar system. So I'm really, really excited that we're looking at Kepler data, and we're seeing hints of planetary systems that remind us of home. This really is the, the Kepler's really taking these first steps towards asking how common is our solar system. And it seems to be it's fairly common. Very cool. So it seems like uh, this was a huge discovery in and of itself, but what discoveries do you think may come next from this data? Where, where does this go? Sure. So Kepler has been described as the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> and, and can you explain a little bit of the background why that's the case for our viewers who might not be familiar with the history? Sure. So when Kepler first launched, about a few months after we started getting our first data down, we found lots of planetary candidates, hundreds of planetary candidates at the time, which has accumulated to thousands of planetary candidates. Uh, now we've moved on to the next job, which is going from candidate, where we think they might be a planet, to confirming that, yes, indeed, they are planets. And also that it's picking out the low-hanging fruit. So which are the best planets that tell us a little bit about us and how we formed? So from that, we've seen a lot of really cool discoveries. You've seen planets that go around binary stars. That's the Star Wars system, the, the, the Tatooine clone. There have been systems that show what are called transit timing variations, where planets interact with each other or their orbits, which allow us to measure masses. And of course, now we're finding, starting to find a lot of habitable zone candidates. So the habitable zone is, is when you're at the right distance from the host star where we think life might be sustainable. Um, you can think of it as a campfire. If you're too close to the fire, you're going to burn yourself. If you're too far from the campfire, you're going to be too cold. So the Hubble zones where you're at that right distance, the so-called Goldilocks zone, where it's not too hot, not too cold, where you want to find planets. Uh, these are the ones which we hope will be Earth-like, uh, where we will then, of course, in the future, start looking, say, can they sustain life? So the ultimate goal for Kepler, and this is what we're going to be aiming for in the next couple of years, is to see how many Earth-like planets in the habitable zone of their stars can be found by Kepler. That's really the next big goal. Very cool. And then would Kepler be a tool that would help us identify if there's life on a planet, or would we need different tools or different missions to find that? We will certainly need different tools to, to tell us whether or not life is there or if there's the possibility of life. Okay. Kepler is the survey instrument to say where are they first. Gotcha, gotcha. So very exciting. So by finding this huge number of planets we suddenly opened this up to a lot of really exciting possibilities. Mm -hmm. Very um, cool. So, can, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well I just, the Havel's own stuff's pretty cool and I can mention yes, that, tell us all about it. It's wonderful. Yeah, I, well, I, I can mention <laughs> that. Kepler is telling us a lot of really interesting things already about the occurrence of Havel's own planets. We may not have found the perfect Earth-like analog, but we have found enough other Havel's own planets to tell us that they're likely very common. So you can sort of uh, use this information to ask, well, might there be a lot of human other civilizations near us? And the statistics seem to tell us in results from Kepler that maybe within 100 light years there might be thousands of potentially habitable zone planets. Wow, that's incredible. How did you feel when you first started seeing this data come in and you, you knew that you guys were onto something really big? Well, I think there were a couple different feelings. Um, <laughs> one was um, being overwhelmed. Kepler is a fire hose. The data just flies at you continuously. <laughs> um, and the second one was um, excitement of discovery. When I started first working with Kepler, I really didn't expect us to be finding the load of planets, the, this, the overwhelming number that we're seeing. Um, I sort of expected the numbers to be hundreds and so forth, not the thousands that are actually coming out. Very cool. So. Um, so right now you guys are at this very exciting juncture. You've had this big success. What is next for Kepler, and what's next for you? 
Sure. So as I mentioned earlier, the next there's a, I think there's a couple key results for Kepler. One is that the results that we announced last week, so the 715 planets, are based only on two years of data. Kepler wow. collected four years of data. That wow. means we can double the amount of data we have for finding even more interesting planets. And while that won't give us more planets, it will give us planets at longer orbital periods, which will be more like our Earth. Okay. So, yeah. And then the next goal after that, of course, is to find the Earth-like analogs and count how many there are to figure out just how common Earth is in our Milky Way. Oh, very cool. Very cool. So what part of that is your, is your part of the project that you work on? Well, I'm going to be involved in probably all of that. Um, oh, very cool. Really is, okay. So it's not an individual effort. It really is a team effort. Mm -hmm. There's about 100 people here oh, in wow. the Bay Area, close to Mountain View and so forth, that work with SETI and both NASA, that are heavily involved in searching through these data sets to try to find these interesting planets. And the hardest uh, job we have is to find the Earth-like planets. And that's what we're going to be uh, concentrating most of our efforts on to next. Okay, very cool. That's very interesting. Okay, so we've heard a little bit about what the team is, is planning on doing next and, and how you'll be participating in that. What What is the future plans that NASA has? Sure, so Kepler will tell us, well, Kepler, one of the main mission, uh, items, or one of the main keynotes that's come out of Kepler is that planets are bountiful and small planets are everywhere. So every star that you look at when you go on a clear night probably has planets around it, and those planets are probably small and potentially rocky. So now that Kepler has told, that, told us that, is the next step is to find the ones that are closest to us and around very bright stars. So that's going to be the job of TESS. So TESS is the next planet hunting mission by Kepler, which is going to launch in a couple years. And instead of looking at a small patch of the sky, which is what Kepler did, TESS is going to look at the entire sky and look at the brightest stars that you can see, as well as the nearest stars. And then once TESS finds those, we're going to use the James Webb Space Telescope, so JWST, to look to see if maybe some of those Earth-like planets have atmospheres on them. And that's really when we start opening the door to saying, could these planets be sustaining life? And in terms of excitement, we're not talking about thousands and thousands of years that human, humanity has been thinking about whether planets and life exist, is this is within the next 10 to 20 years that we're oh, wow. questions. So we really are on the cusp of what I think is some of humanity's biggest discoveries. That's amazing. So it must be, it must be a pretty amazing feeling to be involved in this work at this time where technology and the discoveries that we've made have been just making such a rapid prog progress forward. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a big change and there might be people who are watching where the, and who have <clears throat> some of their young children are now growing up realizing that planets are common. When I grew up, and probably a lot of you grew up, is that we remember the first planets being announced and we had no realization of just how many are out there. And now we know that there are more planets than stars um, and it's really that this generation that's coming up next that are really going to start pushing the frontier towards the exploration of these distant worlds. Yeah, that's so exciting. Every time I read that sentence, it gives me pause for a second. I think, <laughs> what? Even though I've read it so many times at this point, but I still think, oh, that's amazing. I can't believe that we've mm -hmm. come so far in that discovery. So you segued perfectly there into talking about um, the next generation that's coming up. Um, we do get a lot of young viewers on these um, Hangouts on Air. I would love to hear your perspective on what kids should be studying if they're, you know, maybe they saw this press release came out and this really inspired them, or they saw Gravity or something like that and they want to get into, <laughs> into this industry. What, what's good first steps for them? Well, I can retrace my footsteps on what I did. Um, Perfect. So being young and say this is like even before high school or even during high school is that I just read everything that, I, that was related to the subject. So if it was astronomy related, whether it was galaxies and whether it was planets or cosmology, is I just sucked it all in. So that meant even going through popular articles and magazines to just hanging out in the library and finding books and just flipping through them because I just loved every moment of it. Um, then the next big step if you actually want to be an astronomer is, is university. Uh, and that means taking courses other than astronomy such as your physics, so that involves that, and you can have a range of physics and uh, to allow you to get the mathematical skills on top of it nice. to work with the, the type of data and the uh, type of systems to, to understand. 
Um, for instance, how does gravity work? Or how do we formalize gravity? Uh, or how do we characterize atmospheres? That much more chemistry might come into play. Uh, so there's a number of things that you need to study, and especially the sciences when you go to university. Um, but ultimately, it's passion. Uh, you have to have a passion for it that's going to drive you towards the goals. Um, I, I think that when you look at anyone that, that shows success in these types of fields, it's because they love what they do. You're not in this for the money. You're not in this for the power. You're in this for the discovery um, and just for wanting to know what's out there. That is great advice. Um, I'm so excited to see what this next generation of scientists is able to accomplish. Um, mm -hmm. And you were you were mentioning that you would, were just sort of a voracious reader of everything you get your hands on. I think it's pretty exciting for kids now where media is so present. Um, there's a lot of sources where they can get that, <laughs> that information is, from. Yeah. <laughs> OK. So to sort of switch back into um, some different questions, we got a couple of questions um, via our Facebook and uh, Google Plus pages. So we have one from Ryan, I think his name is Vilu. It's, it's a very beautiful looking French last name that I'm not totally confident I'm saying the right way. But right. he had a great question. Um, so his question is, when are we going to have instruments uh, strong enough to be able to tell the makeup of, an atmos of the atmospheres of these planets? That's a, nice, that's a great question, Ryan. Uh, <laughs> so we already do have some instruments that are able to characterize parts of the atmosphere of some planets. Uh, the best example I can give for what we currently are doing is the Spitzer Space Telescope. This is another NASA mission. Uh, it is an infrared detector, so it, it, it detects light towards the red end and the, of the spectrum where heat is emitted. So what Spitzer is able to do is watch a planet move in front of its host star, and then light from the star will go through the upper part of the atmosphere of the planet and then get transmitted towards the Earth. So the fingerprints of the spectra get embedded in the light from the star. So we use that data then to pull out those fingerprints and then start to figure out what the atmospheres are made out of. So for a number of large Jupiter objects, we've been able to determine that uh, components such as water or methane or oxygen probably exist in these atmospheres. Now for determining the atmospheres of smaller planets, say planets that are Earth size and a little bit further away from their host star, the next big step is likely to be JWST. So that's the James Webb Space Telescope. And again, it's going to observe mostly towards the Renin spectrum in the infrared, and we'll also use techniques similar to Spitzer to try to identify those fingerprints and the color and spectra to ask what makes up those uh, what makes up the atmosphere of those planets. Very cool. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this is maybe just a personal question on my half, something I'm really curious about. But do you think do you think that we will find life somewhere else in our galaxy? And if so, when do you think that could happen? Right. So, you know, asking about is there life out there <laughs> is pure speculation. So Purely, no, purely. <laughs> I, I believe there has to be life out there, and that's just the sheer numbers. Mm -hmm. There are more stars out there than there are grains of sand at a beach. And wow. if every star has a planet around it, it's how do you not have life somewhere else in the universe? doesn't mean it's going to be exactly like us, but it's got to be something out there. Yeah, I always think that, that that thought of it not being exactly like us is maybe even more exciting. <laughs> Right. You know, one thing so we've learned, learn from, there. like one of the things we learned from looking at life on the Earth, is that it exists everywhere. You find it in the bottom of oceans, near lava, near the, the lava, but near uh, cones of uh, right. underwater volcanoes. You see life that survives through uh, the Arctic, being buried in the snow, and then uh, coming back to life years later, and so forth. So life seems to be able to survive in whatever extreme condition we can throw at it, and that's just here on Earth. Mm -hmm. So it just makes sense that there has to be life out elsewhere out there. So do you have any? Do you have a time that you think that we might discover that, or is that too much? That's a, <laughs> it's a lot of speculation to say time, <laughs> but the realistic expectations for the first detections, um, they got to be when we start exploring our most nearby stars. So that puts us in about the twenty-year range where we start being able to interpret atmospheres of nearby planets. So if the atmospheres show a lot of like, oxygen and water and methane and so forth, 
that sort of give us evidence that maybe there's a life cycle present or there's some biology that's on there. All that points towards life. Um, intelligent life, that's, you know, the that's part of the job here at SETI, which is <laughs> now asking, can we see transmissions that are coming from these worlds and pinpointing uh, where should we look? And that's an even bigger question. Right. So, but the, the, I think determining whether or not there's any biology out there um, is probably not that far away, at least in terms of how long we've been even looking for planets. So, Fingers crossed. Exactly. What, what will your reaction be when, if and when this happens? What, how do you think you'll celebrate that? <laughs> I will probably start with a small little goofy dance when I hear from somebody. So. A happy dance, as it were. Yeah. It'll, it'll be a happy dance. <laughs> that will be, I think that'll be a pretty common um, reaction. We'll all be pretty excited about that. Mm -hmm. Well, good. Thank you so much. I would love for you to tell us where to uh, best follow your work. Sure. So um, the best place to follow is probably Twitter. Okay. So my Twitter handle is Jason F. Row, uh, put that all together. So J A S O N F R O W E, um, and that's usually where I post updates for work I'm doing, or just general day-to-day -day things, or what's going on, or links to other people's work with Kepler and so forth. So that's the best I can suggest. And of course, you can also follow the SETI Institute, or you can follow the NASA Kepler mission, also on Kepler. And Twitter seems to be the most up-to-date news source I can think of these days. So. Perfect, perfect. Yes, yeah, so thank you for that. That's, um, that's great. And, of course, we would love to have people um, following us on the SETI Institute on Facebook, Twitter. We're also on Google+. Plus. Um, we're broadcasting today from Google+, Plus and from YouTube, and we would love to celebrate that we just hit 2 million followers on that. So we're very excited about <laughs> the awesome community we have on this platform. All of our communities are pretty awesome, though. So. <laughs> So I just want to thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us while we, we have this time? Um, unless there's any other questions or anything else, you know, like, like I said, it's a pretty exciting result. Uh, <laughs> there's gonna yeah, be I would say so. <laughs> a lot more coming from Kepler over the next couple of years. So. Good. We'll keep a close eye on it, and I know SETI Institute obviously will be covering this and keeping the news going to the public. Um, so thank you so much for your work. This is incredible, and thank you so much for your time and sharing with uh, me and the SETI Institute and everybody who's watching today. Yeah, you're welcome. Glad to do it anytime. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, and thank you to our audience. We'll talk to you soon.